Amen. Well, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. If you can take John, the gospel of John, and chapter 11 for the reading of God's word. We're going to be looking at Martha today. We're going to be looking at Lazarus being raised from the dead. And I'm excited about the word of God. John chapter 11, let's begin in verse 20. Here we go. Let's read. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Oh, God in heaven, we thank you so much for our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you specialize in raising things from the dead and bringing them back to life. God in heaven, we thank you that you are our strength and you give us strength, dear God, to face our mountains, to face the difficult things in our lives and by your power, not by our power, to push through them to get to the other side. We thank you that you will never leave us, nor will you forsake us. We thank you, dear God, that you do want to take us to new things and to greater places. You do want to alleviate pain and replace it with a joy and a dancing. And so, God, we thank you that you fight our battles for us, and we ask you to fight for us today to change our lives as we are in your word, increase our faith, to trust you, to obey you, and to praise you. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Can we shout amen? Amen. 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 So today I want to speak to you on the subject of don't give up too soon. Ah, don't give up too soon. Turn to somebody and tell them that. Don't give up too soon. Tell them that. Yeah, Uh because you know we'll give up in a minute, and, and God doesn't want us to give up too soon. Now, we're talking about this whole thing of bold faith, and, you know, this is our year of breakthrough, and, God, I'm going to give you this area, this mountain, and I want you to heal it. I want you to give me breakthrough. I want you to move the mountain, all that type of stuff. But in, inevitably, maybe there's somebody here that the very area that you really want to see a change feels like it's so far gone, seems like it's dead, feels like there's no hope that you just basically say, I don't even want to bring that real area to the Lord. You've kind of got a mindset, it is what it is. I, it's not going to change. It's not going to get any better. And maybe you're tempted to not even present to God the real bold faith area where you're hurting, where you want to see God move because you just feel like it's futile. It's too far gone. Well, I've got some good news for you. Here's what you need to understand, that God is able to resurrect dead things. I said God is able to resurrect dead things. Let me say that again, okay? And you can trust God to resurrect the dead things in your life. What may seem dead to us, God says, don't give up so soon. And so your marriage, it may already be in divorce court, okay? And you may have pronounced death over it. It's over. It's, it's, but I want to say to you again that God is able to resurrect dead things. So don't give up too soon. Your child, your child may have already been diagnosed with ADD and all those other DDs and HDs, whatever those type of things, and, 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 and you see them struggling in school and you're beginning to get discouraged. Lord, I don't know if my child is going to be able to make it through school. I don't know if they're going to be able to go to college, but I want to remind you that God is able to resurrect dead things. Don't give up too soon. Your health may have already declined to the point that some doctor is reporting that is over. Oh, but I know the great physician. I know Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. And he says, don't give up too soon. When we begin to give up and evaluate things from a human standpoint that are dead, that God says, I'm really ready to do something, and if you can just continue to believe me, when we do that, we're going to miss some blessings from God. We're going to bless, miss the new places that God wants to bless us and take us through. We're going to miss how God wants to give us joy where there was pain. And we're going to live with more pain than we really had to live with. And we're going to live with more loss than we really had to live with. And so both faith has to do with God stretching our faith, y'all. And we can't give up too soon. we got to continue to trust God. 
Back when I was a deacon in Atlanta many, many years ago, uh, one of the men of our church um, there, his name was Lou Werner, uh, one of the real strong men of the church, always had a good word, knew the word real well, speaking faith into everybody. He got diagnosed with fourth stage cancer. He didn't find out about this too real late, and, and the doctors basically told him when they diagnosed him, they said, you've got two months. They told this to the guy. You've got two months to live. And Lou, of course, told our pastor about it, told us about it. And, and it was amazing because two weeks later, when Lou came to church, well, he really didn't come to church. He was so weak that he was wheeled into church in a wheelchair by his wife. He couldn't even walk anymore. But he didn't even look like himself. I mean, two weeks before that pronouncement by the doctor, he looked fine. But now through the therapy he was going through and through the cancer beginning to rapidly attack his body, he was weak, he had lost weight, he had lost all of his hair, he was very pale. This was a white brother, and so, but he looked ash-like, ghost-like now. I mean, there was no color in his skin, and it was just so sad to see him coming in like that. Here was Lou, the strong man of God. And the pastor, much smaller church that I was involved in at that time, the pastor immediately on the spot said, we are going to anoint Lou with oil, and we're going to pray the prayer of faith for healing for Lou. He called all the officers, all the elders, all the deacons. I was one of the deacons. He called us forward to lay hands on him. The pastor took out oil. He anointed Lou. All the people in the church extended their hands. And we prayed over Lou the prayer of faith. This man who has about, what, six more weeks at this point to live based on what the doctor said. And I kid you not, we prayed that prayer and Lou continued to pray. His wife, Jean, continued to pray. And the people of God continued to pray. And about a month later, Lou's health had completely recovered. I mean, his health had been fully restored. His hair grew back. He was up out of the wheelchair. He was exercising. He even told us he was running two miles a day. He started leading Bible study again in the church. Listen, God was not finished with him. I said, God was not finished with him. And God's not finished with you either. I just had a member from this church just a couple of weeks ago give me really the same kind of testimony. They, they had gone to their doctor, and the doctor had given them this fatal negative report and told them they were really in bad shape. And then about a month later, when they went back uh, just for a follow-up visit that they had to go to, the doctor did all the tests again and couldn't find anything. Why? Because God's a healer. Amen? Amen. And maybe, maybe somebody then declared something over you. Maybe somebody's made some declaration or determination over you. Now, here's what I found. I found I don't have to silence my critics. I just have to outlast them, amen? amen. I just have to, have to outlive them. And don't let anybody kill you with their criticism, amen? amen? You continue to believe what God says he wants to do in your life. Maybe you yourself have spoken something into your own life, and even you have begun to doubt. My word to you is very simple. Don't give up too soon because he can resurrect that which seems dead in your life if you just keep believing. And that's exactly what happened with, with Martha. You got Martha, you got Mary, you got Lazarus. They're siblings, they're brother and sisters. Their family and their personal friends of Jesus. They love Jesus. Jesus loves them. Jesus has been in their house. Their personal. But Lazarus gets very sick. And as a result, Jesus is in another geography and they send a message to Jesus, hoping that Jesus will come to where they are, take the trip to where they are, lay hands on him, pray for him so he can be healed. In fact, the message that comes to Jesus through the messenger is Lazarus, your friend is sick. They want to remind him, this is your friend, Jesus, so you should come right away. When Jesus got the message, the Bible says he waited two more days. He may not get there when you want to, but he's always on time. Amen. And so by him delaying two more days, another messenger came and basically said, hey, Lazarus is dead. And Jesus turned to the disciples and he said, Lazarus is asleep, but I'm going to go and I'm going to wake him up. Now, from a human standpoint, Lazarus was dead. But what Jesus was saying is that when you're with him, he says, I can resurrect the dead things in your life. So four days later, Jesus shows up, brings Lazarus back up from the dead. And guess what he's trying to say to you? He can do the same thing to you. Amen. Come on, give God some praise. 
And Martha was the one who did not stop believing. Martha is the one we want to learn from in this particular narrative, this historical moment. And so Martha is going to teach us today some key perspectives on how God is able to resurrect dead things as long as we keep believing him. The first perspective I want you to see is that God is with you in your pain. Mm. God is with you in your pain. Somebody needed that. Somebody right in here right now in some pain in your body. God is with you. He's hurting with you. He's not against you. God is for you. So here's the key. If God is with me in my pain, write this down, be sure to keep waiting on him. Ah, don't stop waiting on the Lord. No matter how painful, no matter how futile, uh, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall what? Mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So don't you give up on God. Because he sure won't give up on you. See, a lot of times when we have a difficult situation, we start thinking that God doesn't care. You know, we go there after a while. God's mad at me. God doesn't care about me. And so we just give up on God because we think God has given up on us. But God hasn't given up on you. I had somebody tell me once that they hated God. You know, I hate God. They felt like God didn't care about him. Why did he let all this bad stuff happen to me? I didn't ask to be born. They had all these little phrases and all this stuff going on in their mind. Little did she know, because I know her whole story. I've walked with her. I've seen what God has done. Little did she know that God had a plan for her pain. <laughs> the Lord was not against her. He was hurting with her in the midst of what she's going through. The same is true for you. Whatever pain you may be experiencing today, relationship pain or financial pain or pain in your body, God says, I'm with you in it. My Bible says that God is full of compassion. Ah, and that's why Luke chapter 11 and verse 35, as little as that verse is, the smallest English verse in the Bible, two words, Jesus wept. It's basically saying Jesus wept. Nothing deep there, but there is something deep, and God's trying to not just give us some information. He's trying to show us his heart. He's saying that when you're weeping, I'm weeping with you. When you're hurting, I'm hurting just as much as you are. My Bible says that he bore our grief and he carried our sorrow. Ah, he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquity. Come on now. We don't have a Savior who's unable to sympathize with us. We don't have an insensitive Savior. Amen. Come on now. No, he bore our pain on the cross. But what happens to us is we go through something so bad that we begin to say, God is not there anymore. Why would God let me? God is not for me anymore. We begin to say, or we, we go through something where we say, Lord, I messed up this thing so bad. I've made such, so many mistakes. It's so jacked up, dear God, that it's dead. There's nothing you can do with it. There's nothing I can do with it. There's nothing anybody can do with it. But God wants you to remember he's not only for you, but he's with you in your pain. So you've got to fight that hopelessness thing. You've got to fight that despair thing. And want me to tell you how you fight it? You fight it with worship. See, when the Bible says they that wait on the Lord, whenever you see waiting on the Lord, waiting is not passive. It's not passive like you're waiting for somebody to pick you up at the house and you're frustrated. No. Waiting is a, is a time of spiritual warfare. We're going to be waiting on March the 1st as we're crying out to God. Waiting is an opportunity to go to before God and say, God, I am declaring that you are the one who needs to move. I don't need to do anything but give you praise, and then you will work it out. And I love this because Martha got this. In verse 21 of John 11, look what Martha. Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Look at verse 22. But even now, wait a minute. But even now, Martha... Your brother has been dead for four days. Your brother has been wrapped in grave cloths. Your brother has been put inside a tomb with a big stone put in front of it. You're saying, but even now, that is a faith right there. She is waiting on the Lord. I love it. Does anybody have an even now faith? That no matter how bleak the situation may look, no matter how final, forget about what the doctor said. Doctor, I ain't studying you. Even now, God, you're still able to do something. Since so somebody give him some praise. For some, even now for my children, and even now for my finances, and God, you told me I had a good career. Even now, you can show up and show out and do something about it. 
Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. See, Martha did not give up. Now, Mary, if you contrast the dynamic here, I'm not absolutely sure, but it looks like Mary may have given up there for a minute. <laughs> because Mary, if you look at verse 20, it says that Mary was sitting at the house. Martha comes out to meet Jesus when he makes it to town. Why? Because she's showing I'm anticipating something from you. Mary's still at home sitting at the house. Now, I'm, I'm using my Holy Ghost imagination here. The Bible does not say this clearly, but I just believe that, that Mary may have been a little disappointed. You know how we get... I ain't going out there to see him. <laughs> Lazarus dead now. What, the, what good is it? I'm mad. He could have done something about it. Why was he, what was he doing? What was he doing? When did he get the message? They, you know, he started being investigated. He got it in time. He delayed two days. And so I believe Mary had a little bit of an attitude. And this is so interesting. You know why? Because Martha is normally the one who gets the bad rap between Martha and Mary. We tend to give Martha a hard time because Martha, she was so worried about the practical stuff. Remember that when Jesus came to their house and Mary was hyper spiritual. She was worried about the spiritual stuff. So much so that Jesus kind of had to check Martha a little bit. Martha, listen, what Mary is concerned about is more important than what you're concerned about. She's learning at my feet while you run around trying to make sure the chicken's going to come out all right. It's not as important as you think. The decorations look good. It's not as important as you think. But right here, look whose faith is shining. Martha's faith is shining. Come on, Martha's. God says even a Martha can have some faith, amen, where Mary may not, amen. A bold faith. I like this. Even now, Lord. Even now, even now, Lord. You know what Martha is doing here? She is acknowledging. She is acknowledging the Lord's greatness, the Lord's power, the Lord's ability. And let me tell you what acknowledgement is. Acknowledgement is praise. It's saying you are able to do something about it, even though nobody else can. My brother is in a cave. His body has begun to decay. But even now, you know what she was saying? She was saying God is able to do. You know that song, just what he said he would do? He will fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. He is able. That's what Martha was saying. Lord, you're able. There's a worship there. There's a praise. And one of the ways you know you're keeping on waiting on the Lord is that you're still using your lips to give him glory as you're waiting. In the midst of the pain, in the midst of the tension of waiting to see God move, before you even see it, you have to begin to praise him. I wonder if there's anybody ready to start praising him today for what you're expecting him to do tomorrow. That's when your blessing is going to come, when you begin to praise him and acknowledge his greatness. Oh, you may be mad at God, but I want to encourage you. Don't stop waiting on him and don't stop worshiping him. Oh, you may be disappointed with God. He may not have done something just the way you wanted it done, but don't stop waiting on the Lord. I'm telling you, he's about to do something. He's about to break something off in you. If you could just continue to wait on the Lord, he's about to resurrect something. You may be mad because God didn't do something soon enough when you want it. Listen, he may not get there when you want to, but he's always on time. You better find some praise in the midst of the tears, in the midst of the pain. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in. Come on, give him praise. My mouth. Come on, bless him. Come on now. One o'clock. I love one o'clock. Because y'all got energy. You slept in. So if we just want to go crazy up in here, I know I can, I can, I can lob it up there. Y'all going to slam it, you know, slam dunk it. Come on now, 1 o'clock. Uh, don't give up too soon because you can trust God to resurrect the dead things in your life. Why? Because God is with you in your pain. Not only that, but God is working on your behalf. You can write that down. God is working on your behalf. I was talking to my brother. I was down in Little Rock in December checking on my mom, and I was over to my brother's house. My older brother loved these guys, man, good guys. They were like dads to me when we were growing up. Didn't have a dad in the house, but I had two older brothers. They were serious dudes, and they both have grown up to love God. And we were in his, um, I don't know, you call it a den, a family room, whatever you call it. He's got a pool table there. We're playing pool. It's 12 o'clock at night. And he said to me, Kevin, you know what, man, I'm excited about the next year, man. I'm excited about 2017. God has given me a word. God's given me a song. 
And I said, oh, he did. He gave you a song. Yeah, he said, things are great for me next year. I know God's going to do it. I said, well, what's the song? He says, it's by a guy named William Murphy. Have you ever heard of William Murphy? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which song? You are my strength. No, 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 man. There's another song on there, man. People miss it. But, man, God gave me this song. And so he began to play it for me right there while we're playing pool. He just put it on his whole, his whole system and, and, and basically says, it's already getting better. It's already getting easier. And then there's a line that says, God's already moving on my behalf. And as he began to play that, he couldn't even concentrate on the pool game anymore. He was just over there worshiping. I'm, I'm just loving it. And say, God is working on your behalf. Therefore, you keep working with him. God needs us to believe him in such a way that we move and do the things he tells us to do. Keep waiting on him. Keep working with him. Verse 23, look at this. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha, like, listen, I, I know a little theology. I can flow with you, Jesus. Jesus went totally deep on her in verse 25. Jesus said, listen, I am the resurrection and the life. Let me take you deeper, Martha. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. I've got it like that. I give eternal life when you believe in me. And in verse 26, he says, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks her a question, the same question he's asking you. Do you believe this? This is a faith-building moment here. you got to feel the tension of this moment. Do you believe this? Whatever your bold faith issue is, God's saying, do you really believe this? God's saying, whatever promises you have stopped believing, I want you to start back believing. Whatever you have been wavering in your faith, I want you to establish in this year an unwavering faith, not in man, not in yourself, not in circumstances, not in the economy, but in me. Do you believe this? And understand, in order to really believe the Lord, there are two things we have to do. First of all, you can write these down, we have to believe in the person of Jesus. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will never die. You have to believe in Jesus. If you're here and you've never believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it begins with salvation, eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if you believe in him, you will not perish but have everlasting life. So that's the first thing, believe in the person of Jesus. But also beyond that, believe in the promise of Jesus. Once we become God's children through Jesus Christ, God has given us promises in his word. He says, do you believe this? And listen, God does not abort his promises. I said God does not abort his promises. Uh, the only way a promise that God gives won't come true is that if we, you and I, stop believing him. But God is able to do just what he said he would do. Your marriage is struggling. You're about to give up on marriage. Listen, God has ordained marriage. God doesn't want any marriage to fail. And if you believe God enough, God will heal that marriage and God will restore that marriage. So he says, do you believe this? And so my question to you, what is something in your life that seems to be dead, but you know that God gave you a promise? And whatever that is, that's the area where you need to put that down on this bold faith card. That's where you need to trust God. We're not talking about stuff that you can say, I can pray about this, but I can also go and work it myself. No, we're talking about real stuff where you got to trust God, where it's uncomfortable. Remember what we said when we went into this year? We said if we're going to walk in bold faith, it's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to have to step into places, and, and, and the next step, we won't see it until we put our foot down because God wants us to trust him. So listen, you have this card this week. As you go through it, as you pray, we want you to identify that bold faith area and just put it on here. But notice what it says here. What bold faith change is God calling you to believe for your life? How will you obey God? Think through that. What is God calling you to do? Who will take this journey with you? We're going to talk about that later, why it's so important that you share with somebody else your bold faith issue so they can pray with you, walk with you, encourage you, even hold you accountable. And what did God do to amaze you? Some of this stuff you may not write and fill out until six months from now, but you keep this in your Bible and you keep working through and watch. At the end of the year, you're going to see that God has done some incredible things in your life because what? God does not abort his promises. And so he says to Martha, do you believe this? Martha basically answers yes. 
Whenever the Lord asked us if we have faith, he then tests our faith. How did he test her faith? He made her face her stench. Notice what it says in verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha said, she objected, by this time, Lord. Now, she said, she's already said, even now, God, you can do this. She says, by this time, Lord, there's a stench. There's a stench. It's been four days. See, understand something. God says one of the ways we show that we really believe him is that we're willing to face our stench, the uncomfortable issues, the issues of our past that are still affecting our present, that if we don't address them, we won't be able to go forward in the places that God wants us to go. And so look at verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Believing is linked to doing. Believing is linked to facing her stench. Facing the stench is the first step to our victory. It takes courage to face your stench. And Martha didn't want to face the harsh reality of the situation. Let me tell you what bold faith is. Bold faith has to do with addressing the broken parts of your life, the parts we'd rather not talk about. Whether it's your children, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your own flaws, whether it's your finances, whether it's your character flaws. See, because understand, facing the stench may say, yeah, God, I want to break through in my finances. But the stench is I have not been disciplined. I have to grow in managing finance. I've been very careless and reckless. So I've got to face the stench of where I need to grow in order to have my bold faith play out. Had a, had a person tell me, I, I'm trusting God for me that uh, I'm going to lose weight this year. I said, oh, really? How much do you weigh? He said, well, I don't look at scales. <laughs> and I don't have a scale in my house. I, I don't believe in scales. I'm like, listen, you got to face the stench. You got to know where you are if you're going to trust God to take you where you want to be. I don't know where we get some of this philosophy from, man. But God says we have to face the reality in order to break through, Martha said, God, don't open the door because there's a stench in there. Here's the beautiful thing about facing the stench. Jesus is right there with you, going through it with you, amen. amen. Lord, it's stinky by now in there. It's a mess. I don't even want to look at it, Lord. Jesus is right there with you. God will deliver you from your stench, but you have to face it. And let me tell you some of the character qualities it takes to get to this point. And this is what we need. We need to grow in our character to have bold faith and see God. One thing it takes is courage. To grow, it takes courage. Bold faith takes courage. It takes courage to face the facts. We'd rather kind of uh, uh, please ourselves with something that's not true about ourselves or ignore the truth. We have to face those not-so-pleasant things about our life and really be courageous about it. Let me tell you another thing. It takes integrity. Hello, my name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. That's the starting point of the breakthrough that God wants to do in someone's life. God, it doesn't smell good, but I know I have to be honest about this. I have to have some integrity. That's my first step. Had somebody tell me, yeah, I know my marriage is in trouble, but I don't want to go to a marriage class. I was recommending a marriage class. They said, I don't want to go to a marriage class because then everybody else will know that my marriage is in trouble. I don't want people to know that I got a stench. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not going to even face it. Listen, I'd rather look good than really be good, you know? And God says, well, first of all, you got to understand that people already can see the marriage is a little crazy, Okay. And people ain't crazy. They can see the tension. You may not think they can, but they can see it. But God says, listen, we have to face the reality of where we are. And let me tell you what Satan specializes in. This is why this is so important. This is where some of us are. Satan specializes in us keeping certain things hidden. And by us keeping certain things hidden, he keeps us in a certain degree of bondage or wrong thinking or stuck are paralyzed in the same place. Did you know that there are certain fungus, fungi, that grows better in the dark? And so Satan will whisper in your ear, you don't need to tell anybody about that. That's kind of weird. <laughs> Nobody else really thinks like that. Nobody else has that problem. They're not going to understand. You won't find anybody who will understand that. 
they're going to label you. You may lose relationships if people find out about that. Who knows? It could even end up on social media. And so he puts all those type of thoughts. Well, let me just tell you something. There is no freakish thought that's run through your mind that hasn't run through everybody else's mind, okay? I'm just quoting the scripture. You say, where does it say freakish thoughts in the scriptures? Well, it doesn't say freakish thoughts, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, write it down and study it later, Paul says, there is no temptation that is common to one person that isn't common to everybody. And one of the ways that Satan keeps us stuck is he tries to make us, we are uniquely weird. Your marriage is uniquely flawed. Don't nobody else go through this kind of crazy stuff like y'all going through. Yeah, you might as well go on down to divorce court. That's unfixable, man. Y'all just, it was a mistake. He does it to us. He will lie to you. The devil's a lie. And I'm saying, devil, we're coming out. We are going to declare our bold faith to believe God to give us breakthrough. And we are not going to allow you to hold us in bondage any more. Don't give up too soon. You can trust God to resurrect the dead things in your life. Why? Because God is with you in your pain. God is working on your behalf, but you've got to work with God. You've got to face your stench and deal with it. Here's one more. God is sending people to help you. Hallelujah. God is sending people to help you. Therefore, keep trusting him. Keep trusting God. Now, notice I didn't say keep trusting people because some of us, we've been through so much trauma and disappointment and hurt and betrayal with people that it's understandable why we don't trust people. But I believe that God will dispatch people just to help you as we move from not so much relying on people, but relying on God. Keep trusting God. And God, if I pray, God, send the right people to me. Guess what? God's going to do it. Amen. The reason this is so important is because God often, if not always, in the process of giving us deliverance, growth, breakthrough, new places in life, he often, if not always, uses people. We like to think we're just Moses alone in the wilderness somewhere where God just does miracles, but normally God uses the dynamic of people. Christianity is an intentional people. It's a community. It's not a lone ranger faith. It's meant to be played out in the context of community of other people. This is why the Bible says the two are better than one. And God will dispatch people just to help you. Now look at this. We're studying Lazarus being raised from the dead. John chapter 11. For those of you who've studied this before, have you ever noticed how Jesus begins to tell people to help Lazarus to get his breakthrough? Now, the Bible says in verse 41, these people, now it doesn't name them by name. We don't even know what group they are. They're just called they. But they took away the stone. Now, understand, this is Jesus. This is King of Kings. This is Lord of Lords. This is God Almighty. Jesus could have just done a miracle. He could have just said, Phew, 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 and we'll remove the stone. You know what I mean? Something real cool like that. Jesus could have called down angels to remove the stone, but he dispatched people to help Lazarus to get the breakthrough that he needed. And so Jesus, in verse 41 and 42, he begins to pray to the Father, Father, I thank you that you hear me and what you're going to do. I'm praying this so that others can see what's going on. And then look at verse 43. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, hey, Lazarus, come forth, man. Come out. Now, look what it says here. It says in verse 44, he who had died came out bound. Look at this. He's back alive. He's saved, but he needs a lot of deliverance. He needs a lot of growth. He's still in some bondage. So he's, his hands are bound, which means he can't really work for the Lord. And his feet are bound, which means he can't really walk with the Lord. His Face is bound, which means his mouth is covered up. He can't really witness for the Lord. And in this moment, Jesus could have just out of his miraculous power without the help of anybody. He could have just said, whoo, whoo, threw those claws off and, you know, did all that. But you know what he said? He said to those people again, loose this man and set him free. In the context of community, his deliverance came about. The Lord uses people. He will deploy people into your life to help you to get the victory that he wants to give you, somebody ought to give God some praise about that. I got good news for you. 
If you begin to cry out to God very intentionally, very sincerely, God, send the right people to me because you love me and care about me. Send the right people to me. God's going to do that. And I love this because notice the people that Jesus used. We don't know a lot about them. All we know is they are they and them. But here's what we know about them. They were in tune to the voice of the Lord. So he wasn't just talking about any old people. We're talking about people who love God. He's deploying people who love God to help Lazarus get the victory that God wants to give him. Come on now. God says he will provide people within his house, within his family, who will help you. God will send new relationships to you because he cares about you. I've seen him do it in my life. But not only that, he'll refresh the relationships that you already have. God can touch something that you thought was dead in a relationship as you begin to cry out, depending more on God, trusting God, not trusting man, praying what you want to see happen in your relationship with that person. God will begin to move in that person's heart, your heart, and take that relationship deeper. Not only will God send new people to help you, and not only will God refresh the relationships you already have, but God will even do something with your enemies. My Bible says he can make your enemies your footstool which is another way of saying your enemies, even though they may not like you, they'll end up serving you. They'll end up being beneficiary to you. They'll be, end up helping you. God can turn a relationship that's been a bad relationship into a good one. And God, as we begin to pray, God can really do some things. See, my Bible, I want you to write this down. In Proverbs 16, 7, it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So God says, listen, Don't give up too soon. You can believe me that I will raise whatever you think is dead. I'll raise it back up if it's a promise from me and you continue to believe me. And listen, if we don't do that, we risk having a lot more pain in this lifetime than God really wants us to have. A lot more loss than God ever wants us to have. We'll miss opportunities to go to the next level of joy and peace. Yes, weeping endures for a night, but when you're like Martha and you have an even now faith, there's a joy that's coming if you just hold on and continue to believe the Lord. Just believe him. Come on. Yeah. And so, Father in heaven, we bring you our hearts and we, we, we need you. We're weak, but you're strong. And we thank you with the pain. We know pain means something needs to be better, different, fixed. Whether it's our bodies, whether it's relationships, whether it's our soul. There's a lot of pain of the soul today in our world, dear God. Overwhelmed with guilt and shame, overwhelmed with depression, overwhelmed with doubt, overwhelmed with anger, unresolved issues, unforgiveness. And you've said to us that you're with us in our pain. And you want us to wait on you and you want us to worship you even in the midst of that pain. You've told us that you're you're working on our behalf. You're speaking. You're doing the heavy lifting. And we thank you so much for that. You say if we believe you, then we've got to face the unpleasant things. We've got to face the stench. And we thank you that even as we face those areas of our lives, you're with us. You love us. You never leave us. Some of us, dear God, are not only hiding from people, but we're hiding from ourselves. We're in denial. We haven't faced the reality of, God, this is a problem for me. This is a weakness for me. I'm more of the problem in this equation with this person than they are. Help me to face the stench. Not to be hard on myself, but to receive deliverance and healing and growth that you want to do in my life. And then we thank you, Lord, that you care about us so much. You say relationships are important. Relationships are the essence of life, whether it's our relationship with you, our relationships with people, whether it's family or friends. The essence of life, what really makes life incredible is all around this concept of relationship. We thank you that you will send the right people, people who listen to your voice and who will help us, dear God, get the grave cloths off, the dead stuff that's holding us back, that's wrapped around our legs and around our face and around our hands. Begin to unwrap even today, dear God. I pray you would touch every heart that's here and bring an encouragement and a peace that only you can. 